Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Over a thousand people uh, chose to be here with us today and to welcome Lisa and talk about her extraordinary, extraordinary book, The Vital Spark. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. We're excited to talk about the book. And I am so appreciative to both of you guys for being here and helping me launch this book into the world. You know, when, when you write a book, what, what, anyway, what I want is I want for it to find a good home in the world. And, and that does take some uh, tending, you know, like, be, like being a good mom and just making mm -hmm. sure that the, the kid leaves the nest well. So I, I, uh, I'm glad we're here together to do that today. Lisa, leaning into that metaphor, which I think is so beautiful, when you imagine this message going out into the hearts of women, how do you imagine it would affect them? How would it live in the home of their hearts? Yeah. You know, um, what a great question. <laughs> I really <laughs> like that question because the thing is, I, I think one of the reasons why I like writing is because books have had such an enormous impact on me. I mean, books have changed my life again and again and again for the better. So, I mean, many, I guess, longtime listeners may know the story of how I came to find Jung through the writings of Linda Leonard, a Jungian analyst. And, you know, that was such uh, an, uh, an important moment for me to find her book and read it. And it gave me language for my experience and it opened up this whole yeah. new world. And, and so I would love it if I could do that for someone else. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of the people who read my first book, Motherhood, said, well, I didn't really know much about Jung before I read this book, but uh, you know, now I've, I have a whole new way of understanding my experience. And that's what I hope happens with this book, is, is that I give someone some language to understand themselves in a new way. And, and I think you give so much language in so many ways. I love the book, and I love the motherhood book, because you put out the links to ancient wisdom and fairy tale you give some down-to-earth uh, clinical, if I can use that word, but interpersonal experiences. Mm -hmm. You share some of your own experiences. Yeah. So it comes alive in a dimensional way. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not just theoretical, and it's very conversational and human mm -hmm. and real. And it, it says so many important things for women. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, too, hope it finds a really good home in the world, <laughs> many homes in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I love what you had mentioned, Lisa, is that one of the ways that books inhabit our hearts is through the stories and images that they leave behind. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly central to a Jungian understanding of the psyche Yeah, and how we understand that transition of archetypal forces and information that the fairy tales that you tell in the book stir something in the hearts of the listeners, which is why they've been around for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Yes. And then linking that to the contemporary stories that you do in your book creates this bridge mm -hmm. between these two places, you know, the voice of the times and the voice of the deep. Oh, how yeah. nice, Joseph. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think both of us, you and I, Lisa, found a commonality in how much and how important the voice of the deep uh, through fairy tales mm. can, can affect us. Uh, that We discovered, I don't know, 40 or 50 years ago when we were in training, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that we had a fairy tale that really impacted us. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, the Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's astonishing, I think, sometimes for people that might not have grown up with, uh, you know, with Groom's fairy tales, to realize there are fairy tales in film and in all kinds of other places because mm -hmm. they're eternal and that they do live in us. That voice of the deep is right there all yeah. around us. And, and it's relevant. Not, right. It's not yeah. some esoteric Jungian concept. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It's a real deal. Yeah. Well, and of course, it also shows up in dreams. And I do use a lot yes. of dreams in the book. And so yes, that is a segue to tell you <laughs> that we will be putting links in the chat where you can submit your dream today. And we will be selecting one of those dreams <laughs> to talk about at the end of the podcast. So if you brought a dream with you or if you have one, um, check out the links in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll probably be putting it in a couple of times just as a reminder. Um, and also, we're going to be taking your questions. So there is a Q&A function there at the bottom. We'll stop mm -hmm. periodically and take your questions. And we look forward to engaging with you guys. So. Mm -hmm. So if I can just jump in, Lisa, let's talk about the concept that there even is a vital spark in human beings, mm -hmm. <laughs> that there is a center <laughs> that warms yeah. and energizes and mobilizes the mm -hmm. human psyche, mm -hmm. which, is, which is an idea that in some ways is unique to Jung, you know, in terms of being a psychological principle. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting place to start. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I kind of linked it to this wonderful thing that, that Jung once said that uh, Murray Stein talks about, where he talks about, I'm trying to keep my eye on the central fire. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of that central fire, the, the, you know, the source, you know, the, 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 the self, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that if when we have a relationship with that, it is animating, it's enlivening. It gives our lives depth and dimensionality and a, a, a sense of telos or forward movement. But we know that many people come into our consulting rooms feeling like they don't have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That the ego has a certain amount of energy in its gas tank. I think of yeah. the ego as being... Kind of like an, well, maybe like an electric car, which really can only go about 200 miles an hour, 200 <laughs> miles before it has to get right. plugged in. It has a very limited uh, you know, distance it can go, just um, donkeying its way forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some of the rather sustained, magnificent efforts that we as human beings have evidenced, both in terms of our civilization, but even in our personal lives, has required that something additionally support us. Mm -hmm. And when we are supported by that central fire, we call it the self, other traditions name it other things, that there is a markedly different experience, both in terms of the amount of energy we have mm -hmm. and the sustainable amount of energy yeah. mm -hmm. that we have versus the ego just, I don't know, setting a bunch of tasks on the list and it just kind of donkeys through them all. Joseph, I'm, I'm, I mean, I know that's very true in your experience because I, I know how you work, but I'm, I'm remembering the story that you told on the podcast one time about going through social work school mm -hmm. and how you just knew it was time and the self just really carried you, even though it was really difficult. Right. And um, yeah, and, 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 and it carried each of us, I think, through training too, you know, just oh. that sense that, <laughs> I mean, almost, almost yes. not, I think, at least in my case, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to throw in the towel. It was so difficult at some point, but, but, you know, there was, there was enough vital life force <laughs> to get, to get us over the finish line. So, but yeah. So I, I like how we're talking about the vital spark. You know, that it's not some uh, sort of transcendent flaming arrow that comes <laughs> down from above and lights up our hearts. And uh, <laughs> how come that hasn't happened to me? But sometimes it's in the struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Joseph, you knew it was time, but you work so hard of having a job and going to social work school and all the rest of it. And uh, Lisa, of course, like all of us, we 
the training is a struggle and mm-hmm. it's enlivening and it's yeah. challenging and it's it's a whole adventure just like fairy tales are. Mm-hmm. You can meet some talking animals and that's really great. And you have to swim a fiery lake or two and climb a glass mountain. Uh, but it's something that we know, something that we feel, and it is there in everyone. But it's not some sort of magical mm-hmm. uh, glowing light that, that descends in an orb above us. And, and it would be great if, if the orb <laughs> descended and it actually worked. Like the still, problem is that we have I'm these ready. fantasies. You know, like the unicorn is columphed into the living room, but then we still can't get out of bed the next day. So it's like a That's false true. unicorn, That's you true. know, shows yeah. up. No, you know, not I, not the unicorn, but I you, the orb. Yeah. Anytime uh, I'm here, I'll as long as it gets the job unicorn. done, it can look like anything that it wants to look like. Is my feeling. But let me tell the story for two seconds about yeah, 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 yeah. The social works school because yes. I don't know if everybody knows it, but that uh, when I was a, a senior in my undergraduate class, I took a final class on the theories of personalities, which is where I was exposed to Jung in a very direct way. And I, it was a groundbreaking experience. I had a certainty that I would be an analyst, but that was some far, far distant future that I couldn't quite predict. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a body worker for about 20 years. I was an Alexander Technique teacher, did rehabilitative work with injured classical musicians. And then, you know, the call rang out again. So I had to go through a massive redesign. Uh, For those of you that have looked into it, that you need to have some form of a licensable degree in mental health before you can go into analytic training. And so I enrolled for a master's in social work, worked 40 hours a week, helped raise two stepkids, and when I, it all, and I had to show up, this is before COVID, so you actually had to go to school physically. <laughs> so when oh, I, horrors. <laughs> horrors. Uh, and when I tallied uh, out everything, I, it was just clear that I would have to not sleep every Sunday night in order to just get the work done and get through it. And something inside of me just said, sure. So I oh, just wow. didn't sleep Sunday nights for Jesus. about two years. Um, lots of coffee. I mean, it wasn't you know, the mystical <laughs> orb looked like a great coffee pot floating, <laughs> pouring itself down my throat. But um, not not recommended. Yeah, and but not something I could have done purely from mm-hmm. an ego standpoint as just a wild idea. I'd give it a shot. Yeah. In order to sustain that, something had to help me out, I th- which is where I think we're talking about the vital spark, which sometimes shows up in a way where yes. we're. Yeah. uncannily able to slog through yeah. something that we like when i think about that now yeah i don't know how that happened but, yeah. it, but it does and everyone here probably has an example of the extraordinary stamina mm-hmm. that any of us had to get to some place that turned out to be really really important for us mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. so i wonder in a way if we're talking about meaning of that this matters to me. Uh, Something is calling, something uh, I want, something that beckons, uh, something that fuels us toward a goal. And, you know, having a child, now what else is that but a vital spark? Yeah, Mm -hmm. yes. You know that this is my calling and it's going to be hard. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing we know for sure is that there would be a lot of laundry. <laughs> so, <laughs> a paranormal amount of laundry. <laughs> so, but some, and it's hard, you know, and kids get sick and there are all kinds of trials and tribulations, mm. but it has meaning and it's vital. So, it's the vital spark is in us, it's all over the place. You know, uh, I think. Oh, sorry, Deb, go ahead, finish. Uh, Well, you might want to segue into something else, but I would like to return to the idea of the worthy opponent. Okay. I was going to pick up on desire since we were talking about that. desire. So maybe Mm -hmm. I'll read just a little bit from the beginning of the desire chapter. That'd be great. Um, When Frances Gum was just two years old, she attended a singing performance of the Blue Sisters, three girls between the ages of five and 12. 
When the youngest of the trio stepped forward and began a solo, her older sister recalls that Francis was transfixed. Mm. When it was all over, she turned to Daddy and, I'll never forget it, said, Can I do that, Daddy? Little Frances was born with a desire to sing. She made her own solo debut not long after this event and eventually became known to the world as Judy Garland, one of the most beloved singers of the 20th century. In the most primal sense, desire connects us with life. Evolution has gifted us with appetites that ensure our continued survival. We enjoy food, sex, activity, and becoming attached to one another. Fulfilling these urges is deeply pleasurable and satisfying. We would do them for their own sake, but by engaging in these activities, we also fulfill the biological imper imperative that sustains us and our species. Similarly, we may feel compelled by deep, urgent longings that come from within and make an irrefutable demand upon our soul. Perhaps we feel the urge to create a garden or learn another language. We cannot silence a profound yearning to travel or live near water. Your desires, according to the Kabbalist, are God's promises to you. And yes, listeners, I did get that from my friend Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this beautiful statement asserts that our deep wishes are seeded in us by the transpersonal. Something larger than us knows our secret purpose and desire pulls us toward it. Desire is one of the great engines that drive psychological growth and development. It is one of the clearest expressions of our vital spark. It is a force that moves us out over the threshold of complacency and into life. It calls us forth to our destiny. And yet, we may have been discouraged from honoring or even knowing our desires. We are told they are selfish, grandiose, foolish, or unbecoming. As women, we are particularly susceptible to becoming cut off from knowing what we want. Perhaps we don't even know that we don't know what we want. Many women develop a pattern of ignoring their own needs and wishes, both large and small. Because women often orient to caregiving, our wants and requirements can easily become overlooked. Ignoring our desires can leave us feeling depleted and resentful. When we neglect our desires, we do not have access to the life-giving energy of the central fire. Learning to listen for the insistent prodding of our heart's desire later in life is vital to those seeking mm -hmm. those glowing coals beneath gray ash. Oh, my. You know, um, what I'm thinking about, I'm building on your reference of Jung and the central fire. Mm -hmm. And what he said was, I'm setting up mirrors around the central fire. Yeah. And one of those mirrors is desire. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. One of the ideas that I love about desire versus appetite is that desire mm. is something that we discover inside of ourselves that may or may not be present in the environment. It's through introspection that we discover this yearning and a longing. So for me, desire comes from the inside out, and it guides us. Appetite often comes from the outside in. Uh -huh. you know, for instance, I've had a great big meal, and I drive down the road, and I smell this steakhouse as I'm passing it. And there's a part of my appetite that's like, mmm, well, that, that would taste really good. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I, I feel like I'm going to split my side. But my appetite can be excited about, you know, a stimulus. But the desire to become an analyst, the desire to become a mom, the desire mm -hmm. to write a book, that's something that it's not like we saw it in the environment. And we thought, well, that, that's yummy. I'll be a mom. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but something really deep yeah, activates yeah. inside of us, which goes to what yeah. you were saying, Lisa, is that something archetypal, something maybe it's transcendental, maybe it's in our DNA, mm -hmm. something far stronger than just the whims of the environment right. activates. Right. Well, and, and Hellman talks about this in The Soul's Code. You know, that book is essentially all about mm. the, that desire that you come into the word, world with that, that you need to, to live out. And, you know, it's interesting because mm -hmm. I, I do think some people just feel it more strongly than others. Some, some people don't feel that propelled by desire, which I think is 
you know, just sort of normal. But sometimes people come into therapy and say, or they come into analysis sort of saying, you know, I feel like there's something I need to do and I have no idea what it is. Mm. They feel that divine discontent, but they haven't yes. found an image yet. Yeah. But that divine discontent, the not knowing, is the vital spark. Yeah. The, the saying, come feeling look for of me. the longing. Come and find me. Right. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm prodding you. Mm-hmm. Well, I love that divine discontent phrase, Joseph. That's a great phrase. But, but then, you know, the problem with going to look for it is that it, you can turn it into an ego task. Mm-hmm. And then that's, that's very difficult. Yes. Uh, I really liked, uh, Joseph, your distinction between appetite and desire. Uh, and what you just said, that, that Lisa, that ego goes looking for it, of like, mm-hmm. maybe I should change careers, maybe I should go back to school, maybe I should uh, join uh, some sort of a civic group, maybe, I mean, the list is endless, that, that that is the going outward, that's the externalization, and the vital spark is in you. Which, which brings up this very complicated dynamic between introversion and extroversion because extroverts will feel a longing but if they don't extrovert it then they they don't have a relationship to it so Mm. amazon is driven by extroverted feeling types (laughs) who like there's something i want and it's like oh there it is that that approximates something i want cha-ching you know I'm an extroverted feeling type, so Just like if you're... <laughs> it's unbelievable how many Amazon box happened my way. So sometimes we do, uh, as extroverts, we do search for images that might correlate with the secret, invisible, internal piece. And then introverts often wouldn't go that way, that they would turn within and watch their images and watch their fantasies and how they're talking to themselves. And that feels very natural. Mm-hmm. very normal. The, the difficulty is to assess whether you're an introvert or extrovert. Does the image adequately um, embody the secret fire inside mm-hmm. of me? Is that, is that really, does that fit? Can I put the fire in, in that idea? And so we do try. So for you, mm-hmm. Lisa, I mean, you really were like, the idea of being an author, these books I want to write, my fire fits in that. Yeah. It, and it likes living in that. So all of a sudden, not just you, but the mm-hmm. idea of being an author is also has heat in it. Well, it seems like we're also talking about the ego self axis. Yes. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, so one of the questions, if someone comes in and says, you know, I feel like there's something I'm supposed to do and I don't know what it is, I'll often say, well, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes that's, you know, it it isn't a rational process. It isn't like, well, you know, here's something and I can go through the checklist and see, does this fit? It's just more like that. It's like that, that um, Judy Garland story. And and there's so many other stories like that, you know, Um, just, you know, you just know, even maybe at a very young age, not, 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 I mean, I think there are people who find their who find their connection with that thing later in mm-hmm. life. That's, I mean, that's true mm-hmm. of some people that I'm close to. Um, so it's not like, oh, if it didn't hit you by the time you were five, you're, you're done. But I think it is interesting to say, well, what was, what was the image when you were in kindergarten? What was the image that you had? Just a way of saying that, you know, how did the vital spark garb itself in, in each, uh-huh. each iteration? Mm-hmm. But also, I think we're talking about Ian McGilchrist's work of the master and the emissary. Usually, I'm uh, the one that brings that. I know, into I know, it. and I was tickling your your mind there. That um, the ego thinks it's like, oh, I think I've got a great idea. Yeah, I'm going to go yes. out and do this thing. Yes. But really, the unconscious has sent the impulse mm-hmm. to to go, do, and be. Boom, and the ego is tasked with figuring out how to manifest it. Right. And, and that's the dance between ego and self, that the self needs the ego to incarnate the image in whatever way that it can, given the mm-hmm. resources that are available. That's great. I really like yeah. that, Joseph. Yeah. Because I think, 
You know, so we we get this idea, we have this desire, and some people in in treatment have trouble with that part of it because they can't mm-hmm. even fantasize. Mm-hmm. You know, so well, just like you know, wild, you know, castle in the sky. What do you want your life to look like in ten years? And some yes. people have a lot of trouble doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, if you can do it, then then I always say, okay, now it's time for the compromise with reality. Right. And that, yes. that, which is Freud's term, and that's where the ego takes over. It's like, yeah. okay, well, you know, I want, I want to be, you know, if my, if my castle in the sky is, I want to be an Olympic figure skater. Mm-hmm. Mm. Compromise with reality is going to say, don't think that <laughs> that's going to happen. <laughs> but there are environments yeah. where you could feel like an Olympic skater. <laughs> like there are skating rinks, there are teachers. That's right. You that's could right. have. A, 50 of your friends come and give a, a special performance for them. Right, right. Feel like a million bucks. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I want to take this idea down to uh, a slightly different place, which is, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't have any ideas at all in mm-hmm. the world really? ever about mm. what, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because I was in the era that what you want to be when you grow oh. up is married to somebody. Oh, okay. Mm. That's really interesting. So I take it to what did you like? Ah. What did you great. really, really that's, like? That's great. I like that. Yeah. I, I mm-hmm. liked reading. Uh-huh. I liked going to the library. Uh-huh. Um, my sister uh, liked being outdoors. She and a friend built a raft. And they went down this river, they caught crayfish, they did all kinds of, you know, outdoor kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What did you like? Uh, Your favorite stuff to do. Mm -hmm. And then I think this idea about where the vital spark is can range anywhere from Judy Garland or Frances Gump. She's age two and bing. The fire is lit, and that's what she wants to do. To way later, after having followed a good traditional, um, consistent, conventional, other-oriented path, which mm-hmm. is what a lot of women do, mm-hmm. that you walk into an analyst's office at age forty-something, like I did, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. say, "Whatever it is I'm doing, it isn't right, and I don't know what is right, mm-hmm. but I'm looking." Yeah. Yeah, that's great, Deb. That's that's a really great uh, distinction because I I, mm-hmm. I think that that's true for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And it speaks to Jung's observation, which is right where you are, Deb, that the first half of life sometimes is paying coin to the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and part of that's very pragmatic. We do need career. We need some finances. We need some security. We need the fundamental needs, just as you were listing them, yeah. uh, Lisa, of you know, I have to meet my hunger needs, my sexuality needs, my need for creativity, and you know, we have to have a basically, you know, reasonably well-crafted sandbox. So then in some ways, we have the luxury of considering actualization. And that also goes to Maslow's things. Totally. Like if we're, if we're fighting for physical safety and food, we need all our energy there. I mean, that's, that's the important thing. So the first half of life is, let's get a good platform, and maybe it's mm-hmm. not the most exciting thing, but yeah. we do what we need to right. do. Mm-hmm. And then as Deb, you were saying, at some point, let's say 40, it's like, you know, all this stuff's lined up, all the ducks are right. lined up, right? and I am starting to think about myself <laughs> yeah. and my soul, and like, what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's it timing. Takes many different forms. It takes many different forms. And of the group that my cohort and many a woman that I've spoken to has said, you know, well, if I get to college, then that'll do it. If I meet somebody special, then that that'll do it. I know I'll have mm-hmm. a baby and, mm-hmm. and that'll do it. And and so we're still looking for the vital spark. And trying mm-hmm. things out in the world as we should, right? To see, you know, what will light it, what mm-hmm. will, what will call us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for feeling types, things that we like, 
mm-hmm. uh, is really actually connected to something deeper. It's not a casual acknowledgement no. that I like this and I really don't like that or I really despise the other thing. <laughs> but I would chime in for those of you that are thinking types. You might have a different criteria, but you do have a criteria that mm-hmm. there are some things you think are, are good for you to get involved with and some things you think you don't want to get involved with. So you may notice it, that it's, it's a, an inner dialogue that kind of sources it out. Sometimes it's a liking criteria, depending on your I guess, typology. Mm-hmm. So a couple, a couple of things, maybe if you've joined us recently, uh, you can um, submit your dream for this podcast. We're, we're, this is a special thing. We're going to pick from the dreams that were submitted today. So there's a link in the chat. You can submit your dream and I'll be going over later to pick a dream. And also for those of you that purchase the Vital Spark uh, today, there is a bonus. I'm, I have a, a guided meditation based on one of the fairy tales in the book. So if you would like the free guided meditation, uh, there's, a, there's mm. a link for that in the chat as well. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Oh, yes. And questions. You can put questions in the Q&A. So let's maybe take mm-hmm. a couple questions now. If that's all right. Um, all right. Someone's asking about my glasses. Should I should I reveal <laughs> yes. the secret? Yes. Yes. I, I, okay. I think you it's really tender, should. tender, but tell the truth. Yes. So this is a flippant question, but how many pairs of glasses does Lisa have? They're all very cool and in awe of the way they match outfits. Um, so Ta-da. this is my secret. <gasps> so I, have, I, have a, I do have a bunch of these little frames that they okay. just... Okay, snap. how many? How oh, many? I, I don't know. Maybe 300? 15 or something. No, no. Okay. Maybe 15. Very mercurial. Yeah. Well, it's fun. I mean, it's, you it know, is. it's sort of the uh, aesthetic sensibility of like a seven-year-old, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. And then, hi, hi, Helena. Um, Helena says, this book feels so timely and needed, but that makes me wonder, why do we still need books like this? Why do we still struggle with pervasive oh. patriarchy dynamics in our individual and collective unconscious? Why do women still internalize these dynamics of stifling themselves? Why is feminine fire still so dangerous and therefore kept sequestered, sequestered to the attic, which is, really, which is really great. One of the things that I talk about in the chapter on anger is the Arrhenes or the Furies in Greek mm-hmm. mythology. It's like uh, women's anger just gets banished to the underworld even 2,000 years ago, and it's still there for a lot of us. So, I mean, I know what I think about this question, which I think is a fabulous question, by the way, but I don't know if either of you have something you want to take a shot yeah, at. I want you to bring forward what you've been thinking on this, Lise. So, well, I mean, and, you know, I'd love to bat it around and hear your thoughts, but I think that some mm-hmm. of our tendency to put our own needs aside, of mm-hmm. course, there's a big cultural piece, but I think some of it's just innate. You know, and I, I realize that that may be a, a, a difficult uh, opinion to take on board. But, um, y- you know, there's, there's lots of research that shows that, for example, that women are more agreeable than men. And it's cross-cultural. It's across the lifespan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, I, don't, I don't know that it's just socialization. Of course, there is a cultural component to it. But, uh, but I, I don't think that's the only thing. And, and there's also um, studies about neonates, uh, the difference between male and female neonates, and the difference between um, male and female primates. So mm. again, it's so difficult to, to, to totally take out the socialization mm-hmm. piece. But it also makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint that women would, that the females of the species would be more oriented to, toward caregiving because in most primates, the, the mother does <laughs> yeah. more of the caregiving, probably, probably mammals because, you know, that there's a thing that we're called mammals because of mammary glands, you know? So, mm-hmm. so it's sort of like we're, we're kind of wired yeah. to tend to others. And that means that our claiming these qualities, claiming our authority, claiming our agency, it, it, is, it is both an interaction with the culture, which is very real, and I talk a lot about it in the book, but it also is kind of an inside job. 
Like we've got to get over our own inner injunction against being forceful or fiery. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'd, I'd love to hear if you guys have any thoughts about that. Well, I can say just in my own analytic practice that, of course, just as we were saying earlier, something's going on in us and we, we don't know what it looks like. Maybe it's causing us suffering and then we cast about looking for images or ideas to house or explain our discomfort. The difficulty when we claim that I, I am not actualized because of the enormous political and belief system that has been around for thousands of years, the subtext is, well, I guess you're going to have to wait a thousand years right. until yep. it all changes, <laughs> <right>. because <laughs> if that's what caused it and it didn't disappear, um, wow, okay. So it can yeah. be used as a defense yeah. against going inside that's and right. yeah. laboring in a way that yes. could be very scary. Which um, I have a couple of tracks, which is, uh, Lisa, you can pick up the worthy opponent mm -hmm. of the, yes. la the laboring within. Yep. But, you, but I think it is the always and forever very difficult task of individuating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and Joseph, I was thinking for for you, you have had many male clients. They too face challenges. Now we're talking about the vital spark and women's journeys, but that doesn't mean that there aren't journeys for men as well. No, absolutely. And cultural difficulties and constraints are human. Mm -hmm. And our attitude as Jungians, it's not the only attitude, is that if we take the idea of the patriarchy, mm -hmm. that the patriarchy is a term to describe a, a, a system of beliefs and actions and legislation, etc. But relative to how it affects the vital spark is how is that alive inside of you symbolically? Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, there are all mm -hmm. kinds of other social systems, political systems that are happening in other parts of the world that are quite different. Is that affecting you? You know about it, but the things that affect our inner life are the things that have been internalized. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's the place where we are sovereign. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to change everything happening in our community, our state, our country, mm -hmm. but you have enormous power to examine, challenge, and restructure beliefs, assumptions, images that have been brought yeah. in yeah. and stand against the vital spark and leave you internally oppressed, internally frightened. And I hear this, and we all do as therapists, not just analysts. I've really always wanted to do thus and such. And then there's a gauntlet of images and feelings that seem to have their arrows pointed at the person if they would dare to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's inside of us. And that, that's the inner war. Yeah. So is that where the worthy opponent is? Is inside yeah, it? I, I, yeah. Oh. I <laughs> yes, I so, know you wanted to swing to this, Ned. That's right, we're there. Yeah, no, I, uh, I know. I'm using yeah, every yeah. opportunity. Well, it's, this <laughs> is the right time for it to come in. Let me just read a couple of paragraphs that I think yeah. does, if you just put it so well. Um, women today benefit from the rem remarkable gains of the women's movement over the past century or so. There have been substantial advances in women's quest for equality, and as a result, we have an, an enormous degree of choice and freedom rega regarding all areas of our lives. But throughout my years as a psychotherapist, I have seen again and again that each woman must wage an inner struggle for liberation. Whether we are accomplished professionals, stay-at-home moms, women navigating a midlife transition, or young women just getting started in life, we will have to contend with internal forces that hold us mm -hmm. back, cut us off from our instincts, and cause us to question ourselves. So, and, and Joseph, I think I'm really sort of picking up on, on your point. I, and I, I like what you said about, you know, if we say, well, it's all out there, it's the patriarchy, like maybe come back in a thousand years. I mean, <laughs> honestly, that's disempowering. That's a disempowering message. Exactly. Because unless we're going to go change the whole culture, and we have changed the culture, you mm -hmm. know, and 
And it's worth con- continuing to try to change more aspects mm-hmm. of the culture, but but we probably can't change everything. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and maybe some of it's even, you know, kind of innate. God, you know, that's a that's kind of a a, 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 a verboten thing to say, but I think it might be true. Uh, so, what do we do with that then? I mean, I think you right. you have to ask yourself, you know, where am I in this, and what can I do? And that's where, you know, these eight qualities come in, in in the book that now I came up with this list of eight qualities based kind of on my experience and the experience with my my analysands. It is not a, uh, you know, an exhaustive or or a, uh, uh, a, you know, a decisive list by any means. But here are the qualities that I came up with. Disagreeableness. Shrewdness trickster, desire, which we've already talked about, sexuality, rage, authority, and ruthlessness. That these are the qualities that are difficult for many women to get their hands around. And maybe not all of them. Maybe like, you know, most of them are fine for you, but there's three that are really hard. Um, but, But these are the qualities that allow you to advocate for yourself, uh, change what you can in your life. Uh, not, not that we should abandon the fight for, for, for equality in society, but, but also where can you take power? Where can you find agency in your life? That's, mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the, the central question that I explore in the book, actually, is you know, on a personal, individual level, can you find your agency? So if we think about that list, that in 500 years, that list could change. Yeah. Because part of the list is what has um, been put into the shadow, and therefore we have Mm -hmm. little access for that. It just kind of grabs us from the unconscious, and then we're, we're doing it very unskilled. Yeah. So... Mm-hmm. Based on your observations of working with women and the current research, it looks like the this gold is in the shadow. Yes. And if it were acknowledged, if there were images, metaphors, ways of beginning to get a sense of how how do I put a little copper wire into that, get a little of that juice mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. over here, that I might be able to run that car an extra 400 miles. <laughs> Well, we're really, and kind of get yeah. to my destination. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great metaphor. I think I also want to just add, you know, the sense of power, agency, authority as an inner stance mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, like you talked about, Lisa, the, the compromise with reality. I really don't have uh, the agency uh, to become an astronaut. Mm-hmm. I don't think. I um, believe in you. <laughs> well, okay. Unions in space. That's right. Bye, the guys. first union to go out into <laughs> orbit. I'm all for it. <laughs> uh, but um, what we also can do is to, to have a sense of, I know that I know what I know. Yes. Uh, I may not be able to change somebody's mind about something. I may not be able to get permission for something. I may not be able to get that promotion that I well deserve. But I know that I know what I know. I know Mm -hmm. that I deserve it. I know that this is a political maneuver, let's say, Mm -hmm. uh, just to give an example. I know that this isn't quite right. I know I don't like it. And that's my stance. Now Mm -hmm. I have authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I'm centered in here, not out there of what can I do? Do I have to change jobs? Should I speak to my boss? Should I go to HR? It's all about coming back inside. Yeah, yeah. So the word authority and the word author come from a similar basis. And so just as you were saying, Deb, when you can take control of Mm -hmm. the truth of the story, that I'm going to 
author reality, that also is the source of authority. Yes. I know the story. I know what's going on. Yes. And then it creates a congruity in the personality where and, we're not and, warring with some fantasy. Right. right. And this issue of knowing what you know, which I really like how you put that, Deb, um, you know, to me, where that is in the book is in this category of shrewdness, because I think ah. not knowing what we know is often we do that when we're trapped in an innocence complex. Right. So maybe we can talk about a fairy tale with that. But yeah. um, let's, there's so many good questions. Let's do a few more questions. I do want to come back to this idea of malignant oh innocence. It's so good. Okay, we'll definitely we'll definitely get there. Um, uh, how does one elegantly and gracefully stay true to the impulses of the central fire? Um, Who said uh, anything about graceful? Yeah, <laughs> mm. I'm thinking of Jung's quote about the the hammer and the anvil. Mm -hmm. Right. But what I would offer is. Graceful is, a, is one tone. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I would suggest is, what is skillful? Mm. Because skill implies that yeah. you will be successful. And sometimes um, correctly applied grace might be the skill that's required. Sometimes being very confrontive and disagreeable is a, is a way to skillfully um, navigate what it is that the heart desires. Mm -hmm. But becoming facile, skilled, competent at what is required seems, seems like a path forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a question that I appreciate because it gives me a chance to plug my book. She says, I'm sorry, I'm a little late. What book are you reading from? Oh. <laughs> it's it your book. That's the right. Vital it's spark. in the world. And it, it was released on Tuesday, and it's available uh, as an audio book, and I narrated it this time. I was so thrilled to be able to have that opportunity. So uh, it's available as an, as a, an e book, a paper book, and an audio book. And in fact, if you buy it today, there's links in the chat, and you can also get a free guided meditation that's based on one of the fairy tales in the book. So I do hope if you don't have it already that you will buy it. And if you do have it and you like it, I hope that you will leave a review on Amazon or Goodreads because those really help um, poor struggling authors like me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so let's go back to um, Malignant Innocence. You want to oh, medicine, that, Joseph? Well, and the medicine, that shrewdness is a yes. medicine yep. that is desperate. So, so one idea about malignant innocence is that at some point in our childhood that our innocent child gets sequestered away because the environment is dangerous or um, unskilled, sometimes in very surprising ways. And so later in life, there is a little innocent one inside of us that is full of curiosity, full of life force but it hasn't had the benefit of maturing. So it starts to give us advice from its very, very young perspective. And when we look 25, but our inner advisor is three, that can put us <laughs> in pretty compromising <laughs> positions. And the original innocence becomes malignant. It's not working for us. It's dangerous. But uh, but Lisa, you gave a great example in the book about innocence with the story of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in this chapter. So let me, let me, um, let me read the beginning of it, if that's okay. And then I'll, I'll also find the Wizard of Oz stuff. We're back to Judy Garland. Let me see. When I, so this is the beginning of chapter three, shrewdness, mm -hmm. getting over innocence. When I was 11, my mother let me save up to buy a sterling silver puzzle ring that I had been coveting. I loved it. When I had a chance a few weeks later to take it off and show how to dissemble and reassemble it for a group of older girls I looked up to and admired, I was thrilled. I felt lucky to have been included in the invitation to spend the afternoon at Melissa's house. Though she was just one year older, she seemed much worldlier than I was. 
She had blonde hair, and her parents were divorced. She lived with her mother in a small house that was pleasantly cluttered with interesting things. A glass jar of sourdough starter sat on the kitchen windowsill, and bead curtains hung between the rooms, because yes, we are talking about the 70s. Her mother had taught her how to back up the car and turn it around in the driveway. I was in awe of this adult skill. When I had finished the demonstration of my wonderful new ring, Melissa asked me if she could borrow it for a while. Um. I readily handled it over to her, happy to have excited her interest. She disappeared to another room, but rejoined us shortly. As we got ready to leave some time later, I asked Melissa to return my ring. She denied that I had given it to her, suggesting that I must have misplaced it. I knew that this wasn't right. But Melissa's friends all backed her, of course, and I felt powerless to contradict her assertion. I never got that ring back. When I handed my ring over to Melissa, I was too naive and trusting. I wasn't able to access my gut instincts about what might really be going on. Shrewdness is the ability to see things as they are, not as we wish they were or think they should be. The dictionary tells us that shrewd means having or showing sharp powers of judgment, astute. The term was taken from the small rodent, the shrew, which has a long mm -hmm. pointed snout and tiny eyes. It originally meant evil in nature or character. To this day, the word shrew has two meanings. It refers to the small mammal, but it also means a bad-tempered or aggressively assertive woman, as in, of course, the taming of the shrew. This one word then reveals a mm -hmm. deep cultural truth. Women with sharp powers of judgment are considered bad-tempered or aggressively assertive. To avoid being a shrew, a woman mustn't be too shrewd. Don't see what there is to know. Remain innocent and naive. Yet when we can't access our shrewdness, we risk being unable to protect ourselves. So, yeah. And then, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, Deb, of the, 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 um, the part about uh, uh, protecting ourselves from envy is where I bring in um, the Wizard of Oz. Um, uh, and I, th I think that being envy is something that a, that a lot of women struggle with, like both feeling envious of other women, but then also of being kind of uh, on the receiving end of an envy attack, which can be really serious. Like envy actually really motivates people to mm -hmm. do terrible things. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so um, I am just looking for the part here about uh, The Wizard of Oz. Don't know if I'll, oh, here we go. Okay. So if you think about it, you know, D Dorothy is this powerful person. She's killed the witch. Mm -hmm. um, but she says, no, I'm not. You know, Glinda says, are you a good witch or a mm -hmm. bad witch? And she says, oh, I'm not a witch at all. Um, she doesn't know her own power. I'll just read from this. Dorothy doesn't know her own power. She is too accustomed to seeing herself as innocent and good. Um, who, me? She asked in response to Glinda's question. Why? I'm not a witch at all. I'm Dorothy Gale from Kansas. When the Wicked Witch of the West confronts her about having killed her sister, Dorothy replies that it was an accident. Yet Dorothy becomes the rightful owner of the powerful ruby slippers because she dispatched the Wicked Witch of the East. As Dorothy travels to see the wizard, the Wicked Witch of the West hounds her, hoping to get the ruby slippers. When the witch imprisons her and threatens to kill Toto, Dorothy immediately offers to her the slippers. That's a good little girl. The witch responds as she reaches for Dorothy's feet. I mean, you know, you have to try to do the best. Oh, totally. But the slippers yeah. cannot come off the girl's feet while alive, and the witch gets zapped when she touches them. Dorothy's aggression and power manifest through the action of the shoes while she consciously denies this part of herself. Oh, I'm sorry, Dorothy says. I didn't do it. Can I still have my dog? Dorothy apologizes to the witch, denies her own power again, and behaves naively, expecting the witch to play fair and keep her word. Uh, and then it goes on from there. But I think you can see how it's like when we don't let ourselves know our own power, 
we are more susceptible to others' envy. Yes. So I, I go on from there and I give a case and stuff like that, but I um, don't want to belabor it. But yeah. It, for, for me, it goes to, you know, knowing that you know what you know. If, if we really um, could make this real world and, and you land in some magical place and you have sparkling red ruby slippers on your feet, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you wonder about, ha, huh, wonder what this means, wonder what they do, wonder what just happened here. Uh, something different is really in the air. Now, of course, Dorothy, like all of us, we all have to go down the yellow brick road mm -hmm. uh, to come to know that we know what we know. Of Ha! This yeah. is what's going on here. Yeah. The Wicked Witch is the Wicked Witch. Yep. She's not going to play fair. She's not going to play fair. So that goes to the idea of mediating the archetype. But mm. For mm. Dorothy, she might have all these potentials, and she did have all these potentials in her for being, um, for being canny and tricky and uh, fierce. But she had to find circumstances to incarnate mm. that so that then she could experiment with it. Exactly. See what the environment gives her as feedback so then she can own it and also refine it for that matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The thing about the slippers, though, I just want to uh, put in, because when you were telling that story, I was thinking, oh, this is very similar to the Harry Potter story. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. In as much as in the Harry yeah, yeah. Potter story, this piece of evil is put into Harry Potter that he has to finally come to grips with. And then at the end, he becomes um, dangerously powerful after that. Similarly, Dorothy, for all her innocence, is given her the shoes of the most evil of yeah. witches. Right. And that now that is part of her. She, yep. she doesn't know what it can do. Doesn't, mm -hmm. No one really tells her anything till the end that she can click them and magically transport herself one place or another. Mm -hmm. But she is walking you know, in the feet of the Wicked Witch of the West, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, it's an interesting thing. Um, Joseph, we've we've had a request that you speak a little bit louder. Your audio is a little bit low, so I don't know if you can mm -hmm. move the mic closer, perhaps. Yes, I saw that comment, and I did move it closer. Oh, okay, so hopefully, great. at okay, this so point, it might too. be okay. Uh, but please, if if other people feel they can't hear me, if they would uh, let me know, and I'll okay. see if there's something else I can do. Terrific. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Um, so just, uh, so just to let you know, we are recording this, we will release it as a regular podcast. Yeah. So, um, let's see, uh, someone says not a question, but I really resonate with Deb's take on getting to the vital spark desire. What did you like? What did you do? I also don't have any, didn't have any idea what I wanted to do and wasn't encouraged to think about that. <laughs> and she said, thanks, Deb. This hits home really strong. Uh, yeah. I also see a question, Lisa, that can you expand on the sentence, when we don't know our power, we are more susceptible to others' envy? And I was thinking a similar thing, if you could open yeah. that up a bit more. Yeah. It seems very important yeah. and a bit mysterious. Okay, well then you talk for a minute, because I'm going to try to find that part of the Absolutely. Book. So Deb, what do you think <laughs> of the relationship between well, uh, envy okay. and... Uh, so, and, uh, uh, knowing, that I, <laughs> knowing that I know what I know <laughs> about Joseph tossing the ball to me, um, it's, it's hard to get through an innocence complex. Yeah. We all have it. We all have it. We want things to be just. We want things to be fair. And I'm thinking back to, Lisa, your story about uh, the ring. <laughs> Um, which uh, I once had. Did you have a puzzle ring? I had a puzzle ring, and for the love of me, I could not put the damn thing back together. <laughs> Deb, why does that not surprise me? <laughs> Seemed like a good idea to take it apart. <laughs> I had it, I had it, I took it off, I kept it in its shape, and then I thought, I can do this. I could not do it, and not only that, I projected it onto the ring. <laughs> it was... It was the ring's fault. It oh. wasn't worth it oh, if it God. was too hard for me to do. 
it must be a, a worthless object. It's very funny in retrospect. But I, I think shrewdness and I think ruthlessness are, are hugely difficult because we don't want to see that our boss is really a bit of a stinker. Mm-hmm. That our best friend can be really mean sometimes. Yeah. And worse yet, I can be weak, selfish, yep. re- greedy, manipulative. Oh, the list is very long. So the fairy tale that I talk about in this chapter, the shrewdness chapter, is Snow White. Because mm-hmm. Snow White is so annoyingly, irritatingly passive and naive. Oh, she drove and me crazy. I know. And the, the, the dwarves are like, don't open the door. It's your mother. And she's like, oh, someone's knocking at the door and they're selling pretty wares. <laughs> you know, she keeps opening the door. Yes. So I, I looked at that. But I found the part about envy. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll read that. Yeah, please. Mm. Um, if we are unconscious of our gifts, we cannot protect ourselves from poisonous envy. Envy is a powerful, destructive force. If you think back to when someone was envious of you, you may be able to recall the palpable sense of malice in the field between you. Envy is no joke. It is a powerful emotion that can Mm -hmm. provoke ugly, spoiling reactions in those struck by it. It can motivate criticism and attacks both outright and covert. It is the subtle word in the staff meeting that means we are passed over for the promotion or the lie that spreads discrediting or condemning mistruths about us. When we have a gift that we do not recognize or claim, like Dorothy's shoes, we are more susceptible to attacks of envy from others. The ruby slippers are a potent image of a sparkling talent or trait that belongs to us, but that we have have not yet learned to claim or wield. Other people can see this about us, but if we cannot see it ourselves, <laughs> if we go through life being overly modest and sweet, mm-hmm. underestimating ourselves and our abilities, mm-hmm. then we will be readily become a target for others. Cultivating shrewdness can help us protect us against this vulnerability because we allow ourselves to acknowledge our gifts that might provoke envy. And then I, I have a little client story. Should I keep reading and tell the client story, you think? Yes, okay. yes. I recall the first time I met my client, Allison, after speaking with her on the phone. Remember, you used to to talk to your clients on the phone before you met them? (laughs) It's all email. She arrived for her initial appointment, and I met her in the waiting room. When I saw her, I was taken aback. She was statuesque with an elegant posture and figure. She had a classic beauty and a gorgeous smile. Her hair was perfectly coiffed, and she sported a neat manicure. Her clothes were fashionable without being showy. My first reaction was to feel intimidated and acutely self-conscious of my comparatively unkept appearance. Allison's mother had been a cold, controlling woman who rarely showed her children any warmth and was harshly critical of every aspect of Allison's appearance. When our needs do not get met as children, we internalize this as shame and self-hatred, and Allison suffered from both. Uh, she couldn't stand to see herself in any reflective surface. An accidental passing glimpse in the rearview mirror could plunge her into despair. Appointments at the hairdresser were fraught as she feared she would hate the result and be dropped into a vortex of shame and self-disgust. In addition to being beautiful, Allison was bright, funny, and warm. She had a sparkling personality that made her instantly likable. Yet she often found herself the target of mean-spirited aggression from other women. She had a group of friends with whom she used to get together for dinner monthly, but she became aware that they were gossiping behind her back and she was gradually ostracized. She was deeply hurt by this and could not understand why it had happened. Throughout our work together, something similar happened several times and each incident was entirely mysterious for Allison. We discussed how she managed to find her harshly critical and rejecting mother out in the world and to recreate aspects of her childhood experience unconsciously. I suspected that envy was part of the mix. Allison's mother was a woman who set great store by her appearance. Though Allison couldn't imagine that her mother felt envious of her, it was not hard for me to suppose that this overbearing, critical woman may have, like Snow White's mother, had a hard time watching her daughter grow into her beauty while she aged. 
Did her mother feel envious of Allison's beauty and youth? I thought my, of my reaction to Allison the first time I saw her. Did Allison possibly provoke envy in other women, underscored by the feelings of inadequacy and intimidation I had experienced upon meeting her? Because Allison was unaware of her beauty, she couldn't fathom that anyone might envy her appearance. So Allison went through life a little bit the way Dorothy went through Oz, bearing a bright and shiny gift for all the world to see, while <laughs> she could not <laughs> acknowledge it. And if you can't fully acknowledge yeah. that thing about you that is special and draws admiration from others, then like Dorothy, you're always going to be at the mercy of those who would like to take that thing from you or who would enjoy seeing you fail or have something bad happen to you. Mm -hmm. Developing shrewdness strengthens our ability to protect ourselves from envious attacks because we become aware of our gifts and can anticipate others' reactions to them rather than remaining stuck in self-deprecatory innocence and naivete. So hopefully that made it clear. So what I'm imagining just uh, in summary is that if we are caught in an innocence complex, it prevents us from being aware of other people's shadow yes. and our own shadow. Yes. That if we're innocent babes walking down the road, then everybody else must be a loving mother or a loving father because mm -hmm. the archetypes come in pairs. Yep. When the divine child is present, the great mother is somewhere in the personal unconscious or out in the room. So every divine child is expecting a kind of loving divine parent. It also invokes something called primary narcissism, I think, where the divine child, rightly so, just wants to show its gold. Mm -hmm. Look, I can do this. I can do that. This is wonderful. And the expectation is, because the child finds it wonderful, that the parents will also find it just as wonderful. Now, the truth is sometimes that doesn't happen in reality, but the archetype certainly talks to us and suggests that, well, of course they will. So then consequently, we're shocked or surprised or unprepared for the fact that people around us don't receive our gifts or when we show our gold, don't necessarily celebrate it or delight in it as much as we are. Right. And the showing of the gold is, from the innocence standpoint, is meant to delight. Look, uh -huh. lo, this is so great. Mm -hmm. Right. As you've, you've just... Um really led into a question uh, by a, a, a listener uh, named Adam about trauma, relational mm -hmm. trauma, mm -hmm. and that, you know, the gold was not delighted in, mm -hmm. you know, and the gold for a three-year-old can be learning to do a somersault. Whoa, yeah. really? Mm -hmm. You can? Yeah. Yeah, you want to see me do it again? Well, maybe one more time, and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then I think I'm out. But um, to have that mirroring and to have that enjoyment uh, it is incredibly important, and it ties into the innocence complex of I must be what other people say I am. Mm -hmm. And for women, many a fairy tale involves overcoming the innocence complex. Hmm. Uh, the ones that I can just rattle off at the top of my head, Hansel and Gretel. Yeah. Uh, they come across a yeah, candy cottage in the middle right. of the forest and they yep. go, hey, whoa, good. Let's help ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't you kind of step back for a sec, like Dorothy with the shoes and go, wait a <laughs> minute. This uh, might be a little too good to be true. And then there's old Rapunzel up there in the tower, and she sits quietly every day, doesn't go anywhere, doesn't think to herself, yeah, I'm getting bored. I want out of the tower. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or the great uh, tale of feminine development, Psyche and yes. Eros, yes. or Psyche and Cupid, where yeah. it's just what you were saying, uh, Lisa, she doesn't recognize that her beauty sparks envy. Right. By a, by a goddess. Right. The mm -hmm. goddess is envious of her. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we know shadow, 
if we know that we're capable of being envious, then then by extension, well, of course, even my mm -hmm. best friend could be envious. I sure. experience envy, or my friend could be um, spoiling occasionally mm -hmm. because I understand that I have been spoiling or could be spoiling. And then when we have that impulse to sh to share our gold, part of us is like, is this the right time? Is this person in the right mood? Mm -hmm. you know, what's at the forefront of her personality? Am I going to get the supportive yep. side of this yep. person? Or is she yep. exhausted and she's going to really right. just give me a nip on the hand? And welcome to reality. Mm -hmm. Welcome to complicated human relationships, which little ones shouldn't have to know about because you're three. But mm -hmm. when we're older, we're expected to be able to ask this question of, how is the environment likely? To respond and is that okay with me? Mm -hmm. And to discern, I mean, again, this is all our internal work of, you know, my showing my gold that I can do these things and I want to go for it, you know, or am I just being boastful? Mm -hmm. But oftentimes our gold is perceived as being boastful and being self aggrandizing, and that's really very, it's really not done. And so, and so we hide our gold. Yeah. And then um, this is, I'm still back uh, in some part of me with a, a, a an extension toward Adam. Then we mm -hmm. don't enjoy, we don't enjoy ourselves if we weren't enjoyed by others. We learn to tamp ourselves down. Mm -hmm. And then there's no gold. And that goes to the beginning of your book, Lisa, about finding the vital spark, because if our good stuff was yeah. mistreated and we had to hide it, hide the right. treasure away, even from ourselves, maybe, there's a, a listlessness and, and the sense of, I don't know, people keep, my, my boyfriend and my girlfriend keep asking me what I want to do tonight. And I'm like, I don't know. Yep. I can't, <laughs> knowing what I want, who, I what is that? Right. And so then there's the discovery. It's not an innocence complex, but it's like there's a missing part of me, and it's become a problem. Yeah. And that's where your book starts in a lot of ways. There is, Adam, a real link, I think, between this, this subject about innocence and trauma. And, and actually, in the shrewdness chapter, I talk a little bit about trauma. And it's partly because one of the things that happens with childhood trauma is that we don't, we sort of have a choice about whether or not to identify with the aggressor. And, and if we don't do that, um, uh, then, then we often kind of take shelter in a kind of innocence. And it's, it's a little more complex than that, but um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do a, a good job of explaining it here. But I, I did just want to mention that. Let me just um, go, go do another loop of announcements because I, I do see a lot of questions coming in. So um, so we're going to keep talking. We're going to answer. There's so many questions. We'll probably stick with the questions for a while longer. This is being recorded. It will be released as a podcast, probably not this Thursday, but the following Thursday. So if you missed part of it, you can listen again. Mm -hmm. We are talking about my book, The Vital Spark, Reclaim Your Outlaw Energies and Find Your Feminine Fire. It is available as an ebook. It's available as a print book. It's available as an audiobook read by yours truly. There are links in the chat to purchase it. And if you purchase it, you can also uh, receive a free guided meditation that's based on one of the fairy tales in the story. And we also are looking for dreams. <laughs> so, we are going to pick a dream from those of you who are here today. There is a link in the chat where you can submit your dream. We'll be moving to the dream probably somewhat soon. So go ahead and get those dreams in. So what do you think? Should we, um, should we answer more questions? What, what do you, what? I, I, I want to loop okay. back. You loop. I may have got my, but I think it's a general question that, um, Adam has sparked about, you know, what do we do about this? And I think uh, something like our conversation today, um, certainly your book, Lisa, can get it to go started up here. We can mm -hmm. think about it. There are words for it. There are fairy tales. There are case examples. We see it in our friends. Good heavens, you can even see a lot of it at the grocery store. 
Mm -hmm. So it can start up here like something's fishy. Ha! Huh. And let it percolate down. Uh, of course, you can read more. Of course, there are things like therapy. So there are options once you have the cognition in your head that this doesn't add up. That's a great place to start. Well, and I think that, you know, one of Jung's uh, really important insights was, was how, how key it is to personify contents from the inner world. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, that's the practice of, in, in, uh, of, uh, of uh, active imagination, but that's also what happens in our dreams is that con mm -hmm. inner contents get personified. And then the thing that's so helpful about that, which goes to what you were saying, Deb, is then we can relate to it. If you have an image for something, if you have a story for something, if you have words for something, yes. you can then, you can think about it. You can walk around it. You can put it away and come back to it later mm -hmm. where it, when it's not formulated yet. And when it's just kind of rattling around and you can just sort of feel like, ah, I know something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. You can't, you don't have, a, you don't have like that right. space between you and it. Once, right. once it's personified or, or even languaged. You can stand over here and you can be like, oh, there's that thing there. I wonder about that. And maybe it's connected to this. And so it really changes things to have things formulated, which is, a, I think, a lot of what we actually do in therapy is help right. people formulate things. Then you can start to have it instead, instead of, of it, it having, having you. you. Right. And, which and that's means where we go. Mm -hmm. The value I mean, of fairy tales. I don't know tales. what this thing is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what this thing is. Something's bothering me. Yeah. It has you. It, that's great. That's a place to start. And then creating that distance with words, dreams, images, understanding, a hundred things. Then we can start to separate enough. So, oh, now I can see it. It's over there. Um, I just, I just want to answer a question. We are not going to be interacting with a dreamer on the podcast. So if, if you submit your dream, you, no one has to know who you are. You won't be asked to talk. So I, I, someone asked that and I hadn't clarified that. So don't let that fear of that stop you from submitting the dream. It's, it's something makes us brave if uh, our name is not attached to something, which sometimes helps us and sometimes it's a problem, but. I can understand the freedom of that. But almost anything can be an opening. Almost anything can be a place to begin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lisa, are we waiting for a dream or can we throw another topic out? Oh, we can throw another topic out. We have, we have time. I, okay. I, because I, we've spoken about this frequently on the podcast, that in Chapter 9, you introduced the medicine of ruthlessness mm -hmm. and owning one's aggression. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear more about that and to contextualize it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I've, I've presented on, on this topic a few times for young, young groups and one group, usually there's someone who says, well, I, I like what you're saying, but I would never want to try to become, you know, a trickster because then that would be manipulative or someone will say, well, I can agree with everything you're saying except for ruthlessness. I don't think anyone should ever <laughs> cultivate ruthlessness. But, but really what I mean by ruthlessness, first of all, is the ability to do something that's going to make someone else uncomfortable that is in the interest of um, wholeness and growth, let's say, of your wholeness and growth. Uh, so the, the little example that I give in the chapter is, um, when I was in my twenties, I was seeing a therapist and it wasn't a good fit. And, um, I was like, oh, I should really stop this. You know, it's a lot of time, energy and money, and it's not, it's just not working for me, but I didn't want to quit because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I didn't like, I, I just was dreading doing it. And, um, and then I had a dream that I was driving around with Tony Soprano. <laughs> and the thing about Tony Soprano is that, you know, he could do, I guess that must have been a little bit later. I, I, I suppose I was in my 30s because timing. But anyway, um, you know, Tony Soprano, man, he would do the, the hard things, right? He, he could be ruthless. He, he sure know, could. If he needed to kill his friend, he would kill his friend. 
And so, uh, so I'm, I'm talking about ruthlessness as a kind of psychological capacity. And I'm not taught when any of these qualities, I'm not saying you should go through the world as a, as a ruthless person. What I'm saying is you should develop this as a capacity that you can use when you need to. Yeah. So um, let me just see if I have. Um, so so um, one of the things, and Joseph, I would love to, to bring this up with you because I know that you love the film too, but I, the fairy tale that I use, or I use a couple different fairy tales, but one of the ones that I use is my all-time favorite fairy tale, Vasilisa the Beautiful, because, um, you know, um, Baba Yaga's pretty ruthless. I mean, she eats you if she doesn't like you. <laughs> she means business. <laughs> and Vasilisa is very sweet and has had a very good mother doesn't know how to, you know, doesn't know her own aggression. And she has to go kind of become an apprentice to Baba Yaga. So she very sweet, uh, beautiful, Vasilis the beautiful. She goes into the dark forest. She needs to ask uh, Baba Yaga for some fire because the fires, her, her evil stepmother and stepsisters have sent her out under the pretext of asking for fire, but really they want her to be killed. So she goes out into the forest. She goes to Baba Yaga's hut. She says, um, I, you know, I, I, need, I need some fire. And Baba Yaga says, well, come on in and you have to work for it. So Vasily says to do all of these tasks and she does them really well. And then Baba Yaga says, all right, get out of my house and here's the fire. Don't forget to give this to your, your stepmother. So Vasilisa, the fire is um, a skull whose eyes burn. So Vasilisa's... Uh, holding the skull aloft in the night uh, to light the way home. She gets home and um, she, it's the dawn breaks and, you know, she's like, Oh, I bet they figured out they could, they got light a long time ago. Let me just throw this skull in the bushes. And the skull says, don't throw me away. Baba Yaga told you to give me to your mother, your stepmother. So Vasilisa goes in with the skull and the skull, the eyes start burning and they, they burn the stepmother and the stepsisters to death. So, Vasilisa found her. <laughs> she found her aggression. She had to go and become an apprentice to Baba Yaga in order to find her, uh, her ruthlessness. And then the film that I contrast that with, which is so fun, is The Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> because um, Anne Hathaway is the ingenue. She's Vasilisa. And she has she apprentices herself to Baba Yaga, otherwise known as Meryl Streep in the role of um, Miranda Priestley, and 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 Anne Hathaway has to learn, or her character's name is Andy. Andy has to learn how to you know grow a set basically, you know, <laughs> and then she she uh, she she earns uh, the witch's uh, reward. So, um, so it's, it's really fun. That's such a, that's such a fun movie. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's ruthlessness. But one of the things that, um, Miranda Priestley teaches, um, her protege and perhaps Bobby God teaches Vasilisa is that it matters. And I really want that to sink in because part of what Anne Hathaway brings when she starts her internship is that nothing really matters. Mm -hmm. You know, Miranda Priestley is like, how are you dressed like that? You're an intern, like a fashion, right. uh, you know, agency. What, how, how did you think that didn't matter? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so part of it is this um, waking up her and saying, this matters, this matters, this matters, and this matters, and yeah. this matters, and this matters, and wake up to what matters if you want to have a place at least in her world yeah that way and so i so for vasilisa whatever the stepmother and the stepsister represent or what they're doing to her or how they're affecting her it actually matters and pretending something doesn't matter keeps you in mm -hmm. an innocence complex or keeps right. you from being effective mm -hmm. yeah uh, and being being nice, being nice. Uh, Snow White was nice. 
There's a dear old lady at the door. Oh. <laughs> what I think I want to parse out a little bit is, uh, you know, all of the sort of gradations of, of ruthlessness. Mm. I mean, you heard a dream with Tony Soprano in it. He was ruthless. If he had to kill his best friend, and he did yeah, have to no kill. No spoilers, no spoilers. Maybe not everyone has seen it. Well, guess kidding. what? Guess what he did? <laughs> uh, but that there Deb, you aren't a, looking at all of us with a particular lean <laughs> when you're saying that. Just, just you, Joseph. Killing best friends. <laughs> mm. uh, but is it ruthlessness like Miranda Priestly, where this is business? Mm-hmm. You know, as you said, you know, kind of grow a set, grow up, get real. You're working for a fashion magazine. Right. You can't come in looking, you know, really sort of half put together. Right. right. It's the fashion magazine. It's not the Village Voice. <laughs> exactly. And he McDonald's uh, like, why would you care what color blue it is? It's right. blue is blue. Right. Yes. It's like, hello. It's, <laughs> but right. th- th- that is a different thing. That's a reality check. Uh, you know, wake up, get with the program. And the same thing is true of Baba Yaga, of that you, you have to be savvy with Baba Yaga. Do the chores. Don't be an idiot. Don't be a klutz. Get on it. That'd be excellent. Versus Tony Soprano, who is unfeeling. Well, mm-hmm. I, so first of all, let's just have this out, okay? I don't think Tony <laughs> is unfeeling, all right? I know there, there's there been much oh discussion <laughs> about whether or not Tony is a sociopath, and I think he's not. I mean, maybe we have someday we should just have this out, but I don't think he's... I mean, he when he when he has to kill, is it pussy that he kills? He He's yes, like wrecked. Pussy. He's not happy about it, and he's haunted by it. But 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 wait a second. And the other thing is that in um in in uh in in um Miranda Priestley actually there's this moment in The Devil Wears Prada, there's this decisive moment where Andy has to stab her coworker in the back and she does it. Now she does it, you know, ah. figuratively, whereas Tony yes. Soprano would do it literally. Yes. But um but I mean Tony Soprano, it was business. You know, he just he just had to do what he had to do. He I, anyway. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm a had, Tony fan. I have had to do it a couple of times. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Oh, I do, too. And I feel terrible about it, which is obviously absolves me uh, <laughs> from from all those dead bodies in the middle of the lake. Oh, <laughs> Uh, well, if you're so lucky that you live oh, near Deb, the water, uh, though, Deb. You're transforming before my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> getting everybody's getting scared. So uh, I think it's I think what we may actually have landed on is this question of ruthlessness is complicated. Yeah. yeah. And and does oh I feel really bad about it. Does that really absolve you? Is that part of it? Do you hold the ambivalence? Oh, I it's th- these are not cut and dry kinds of issues and questions in the psyche. What, what I would say for, for the purposes of my book, what I was interested in <laughs> is how do you, can you access these qualities when they're in the interest of growth? Yes. Right. So are you being, are you, are you not, you know, I'm thinking of the moment in the movie where, you know, the character Emily has been looking forward to going to Paris and uh, Meryl Streep says to Anne Hathaway, I want you to go to Paris. And and Andy's like, oh, no, 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 I couldn't do that to Emily. And, you know, Meryl Streep is like, oh, well, if you don't, I will consider that you don't, you know, want a future here or something like that. Right. So so she does it. And it's, you know, if she didn't do it, would that be a kind of false niceness? You know, can she can she can she be can she be effectively selfish? I want to read this great quote in here by Edinger, which I think sort of it's a really central, it's a really central quote. It's by uh, Edinger. Who's Edinger? Oh, Edward Edinger. Thank you, Deb. Was (laughs) I'm like, Deb, it's Edinger. You know who? Anyway, yes. (laughs) He he was a Jungian analyst and a very prominent and important one. So he says, in my experience, the basis of almost all psychological problems is an unsatisfactory relation to one's urge to individuality. 
And the healing process often involves an acceptance of what is commonly called selfish or power seeking. The majority of patients in psychotherapy need to learn how to be more effectively selfish and more effective in the use of their own personal power. They need to accept responsibility for the fact of being centers of power and effectiveness. So I'm thinking of Andy needing to stab her coworker, mm. Emily, in the back. And that's, that's ruthlessness in service to growth. So that's the thing. It's not, it's not that you're doing it to just because you enjoy uh, hurting someone. That's sociopathy. Right. And that's like um, Janice's boyfriend. I can't remember his name. Oh, my God. He was in, in at like season two or three of The Sopranos, like really scary sociopath. But Tony doesn't enjoy doing it. He just does it because he has to. Well, well, I think I think I'm just going to summarize this. <laughs> that, that any of the forces, uh, personality forces that are put in shadow and then are needed and called forth, they all have to be subject to intent and context. And consciousness. And con well, of course, and consciousness, yes. because in order to do it, you don't have to be conscious of them. So you know, when is it okay to be ruthless? And if I think of ruthless as an absence of empathy, right? you know, there's the, this is the task that has to be done. Now, you know, if I was going in for brain surgery, I want the surgeon to not be you know, worried, oh, but you know, it could hurt. Like, I want them to know what they're doing, <laughs> yeah. get yeah. it done, not be terribly emotional. And it takes a lot of aggression to go in there, and get that tumor out. It's like, we're not going to protect the tumor because it might feel bad. Uh, you know, it's, it's out. Yep. So there's a sense of this is the task. Mm -hmm. um, sentimentality is interfering. Mm -hmm. there, there's no room for sentimentality. Yeah. There just are the facts and right. orienting to the facts relative to the mission. And when the mission is important enough, then sentimentality often has to be put aside. Yeah, yes. Well, you know, I think um, the Tony Soprano thing, that if it's in the service to growth, uh, you know, I can't give Tony too many points. <laughs> I know. You I know. know. I probably it's, took that way too far. You know, I, I'm thinking about one of my uh, grandkids uh, who had four years on his sister. And he could be like a little boy. You know, if he wanted that toy, you just take it. Mm -hmm. And then his mother, my beloved daughter, would say, you have to say sorry. <laughs> so he would say, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and at any rate, uh, this is a, a obviously a huge topic, and yeah. is, and I agree with you entirely that is it in the service to my individuation and growth, and that I have to come to terms with the fact that I'm not always nice, and that my choice is going to hurt somebody, like mm -hmm. like Emily's choice hurt her coworker, right, and that's. What I'm doing, is it yep. really in consciousness? Yes. Yes. Uh, and is anybody, is it going to do anybody good for me not to go to Paris? Mm -hmm. Well, then mm -hmm. neither Emily nor her coworker go. Um, well, then. Well, I think if I think if Andy hadn't gone, Emily would have gone. So again, oh, I, I'm, I got the characters back. But but Sorry. it's okay. But the the re, the reason I'm making that I'm making the point though, Deb, is it's it's because thinking well, would anyone benefit if I did if I didn't go is an other orientation. Yeah, that's and I right. think I think women are always we're always orienting, which is great, and it's important to be able to not do it sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we internalize that as an internal community, part of what Jung's general message is that the ego and the self have their own agenda for the actualization of the personality. And all of the competing agendas inside of us or outside of us have to be subordinated in order to be prioritizing individuation, mm -hmm. which goes to what you were saying, Lisa, of is it in service to growth? And of course, the right kind of growth. Right. And, and what does it take to say, you know, this person is responsible for their own feelings, 
about thus and such. Right. And that my individuation process is a priority if one believes it is a great human venture to become mm -hmm. who you truly are mm -hmm. in all its fullness. Mm -hmm. Now, that may, yeah. may only have the resources or the luxury of doing that in the second half of life, which is perfectly fine. But at a certain point, it's like, you know, honey, you're 40. Don't think I can pay your rent um, for the next year because I'm going to take that money and I'm going to go to Paris and learn how to paint because I've wanted to do that since I was four. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and she, the daughter might say, you're ruthless. Oh, my God, you're destroying me. I get it. Of course she might feel that way if she was dependent in that way. Yeah. But at a certain point, the self demands the resources right. and opportunities because something larger than you wants the opportunity to live in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and Joseph, you said, you said it's something really great back toward the beginning. You said that you know, the, the, the desire presses up from mm -hmm. the, the self and then it's up to the ego to to carry that mission forward. And I and I don't know that I thought about it that this way before, but I think in some sense what I'm saying in the book is that you need these tools, you need these qualities to some sometimes you will need right. them to fulfill your mission. So right. so let's mm -hmm. let's switch dream. I want to tell you guys there's like a hundred and fifty dreams. Ooh. How are you going to choose? I got and one. We can, I got you one. got one. We, okay. We can only do 75. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. We'll be here till 2 in the morning. I'm game. <laughs> <laughs> but before we go, the book is The Vital Spark, Reclaim Your Outlaw Energies and Find Your Feminine Fire by me. Uh, there is an <laughs> audio book, and it's available, and it's read by me. And there's an e-book, and there's print book, and you can order it at the links. Uh, you can sign up to get a free uh, meditation that's based on one of the fairy tales in the book. Uh, links are in the chat. This w is being recorded. It will be produced and released as a podcast. So you can come back and listen again. Um, and uh, yeah, please buy the book and um, please leave a review, especially if you liked it. Leave a review on Amazon and Goodreads and Thank you all so much for coming and helping me celebrate the book launch. And mm. thanks to Deb and Joseph. Today's dreamer is a 42-year-old woman who works as an artist. And uh, do you guys have it up? Do you want me to give you a minute before I start reading? Yeah, give me a minute. Okay. Uh, 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there were workmen digging in the front yard of my childhood home where my parents still live. I was in one of the trenches myself, and I kept unearthing warthog skulls. Mm. I kept finding one warthog skull after another. Then I saw a lilac light glimmer through the soil. I dug down and found a unicorn skull with a glowing lilac horn. I quickly looked around to make sure no one else saw it. I reburied it, saying that I will come back later at night to get it. And she notes that a, this dream happened several years ago when I started a job at a major corporation, but it has remained really present. I just left that job to pursue my art full time. Mm. And the main feelings in the dream were wonder and keeping of a secret and a feeling that this was incredibly important. And uh, she notes that the unicorn skull seems to mean something about her creativity and artistic skills. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a lovely, uh, really interesting image here. You know, it's interesting that that image showed up in this dream that got chosen. And earlier on, you, we mentioned unicorns. Right. Yeah. And yeah. would you want one crashing around in your house? And, your answer was, sure, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Sounds good. So, it's, it's interesting that this image has um, shown up in those two ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at the dream. Well, the first thing, I, just starting at the beginning, is um, they're digging in the front yard of the childhood home. Mm -hmm. So the setting in the beginning generally matters in a dream, and I will often 
in my own mind, think, oh, so there's going to be work on the childhood or work mm-hmm. on the childhood complexes. Mm-hmm. And, and, this, and something greater than us has decided, well, that's a priority. That's, that's what we're going to be digging around in. And something's going to be dug up or excavated or unearthed. Right. So, you know, if something's, if something's buried in the ground, it, it, it's been there for a long time mm-hmm. without our knowing about it. Yes. But, it, you know, it was in consciousness before, but now it's, it's gone unconscious. You know, I'm going to just Google warthog. <laughs> I was thinking about Lion King. Were those warthogs? Yeah, I guess they yeah, were. There was a the warthog, one of the warthog. And, and hyenas. Hyenas, right. But the, the warthog was actually one of the good guys. I oh, was he? Okay. But what does it say on Google? Oh, God, they are ugly. <laughs> I, I think that if we see them as part of the pig family, that they would be associated with the, the very primal, super primal great mother. Mm-hmm. Yes. the pig... Who, who survives in the wild, also has numerous children, has numerous nipples, is big and robust. I mean, that's that symbol of nature as the fecund mother. And I think, I think wasn't the pig sacred, was it to... Um, Demeter, Ceres. Demeter, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the earth goddess, it. goddess of growing things, where mm-hmm. we get the word cereal from. Mm-hmm. So I think of warthogs as being in that same place. Uh, uh-huh. Although they seem more exotic to us, not being from our part of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I'm imagining, though, uh, you know, from your instant reaction, Joseph, they're they're really not attractive. They're ugly. Unlike but, the beautiful pigs that roam around, <laughs> that are just fetching. Right. Uh, pigs, pigs are smart. Pigs they are. are sentient, and mm-hmm. pigs go from being little piglets to being market weight of 200 and some pounds or more. in months, a matter mm-hmm. of months, right? Uh, which is amazing. But my guess is that she's in the process. I like that she's in the trenches. Mm-hmm. Yes. And she keeps on going with unearthing these ugly, pig-like, not pleasing personas. They're not beautiful deer or adorable Persian cats. There's their shadow. They look ugly, but they have value. They are primal. That you know, they are associated with the goddess. And she keeps going. It looks like, gosh, all I'm getting is warthogs here. Ugh. Warthogs that? all the way down. War- exactly. <laughs> And then I saw a lilac light. Mm -hmm. And finds the unicorn skull. Oh, I know. It's it's such (laughs) an astonishing image. What do we think about lilac? Mm. I mean, purple is associated with... um, in, like the emperor, also yeah. with individuation, but lilac is a, you know, is a pale. I'm, you know what I just realized I can do? Pale I can purple. share. I can put the dream up on the screen. Aha! Uh-huh. So people can see it. Um, oh my gosh, that's that's just great. So, uh, but so lilac is it? It's it's a pale purple. So it might be something kind of nascent or that's just kind of beginning mm-hmm. but it, it, also, it, it also evokes the flower but the word purple mm. has only a meaning it's only a color but lilac right. is both a color but also a flower mm-hmm. yes so it has a, it evokes several qualities to it and lilacs mm-hmm. of course are fragrant they grow in cold terrains so they don't grow in real warm areas because they need they require a very hard winter freeze do in order they? for the buds to set, yeah, because I've tried to grow them down here in North Carolina, it's just sad. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna check um, my. Yeah. I'm gonna check my um, symbol dictionary, Joseph. I like that idea mm-hmm. about lilacs. Let me just see if that's in here. So um, your, it, uh, it, mm-hmm. yeah, that's great. It's also interesting that it's shining through the soil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, now. 
No lilacs in the symbol dictionary. But but I want to footnote something uh, okay. just for all our listeners. Uh, just notice what we did. Uh, as soon as warthog came up, it's, oh, let me see what they really look like. Mm-hmm. As soon as lilac came up, of, oh, let me see what else this is associated with. Yeah. And that, that that's a huge part of, of look it up, get an image, get a definition, get a, a, a link to a myth or a fairy tale so that we can amplify the image and make it bigger and get to the meaning. So let's go to the central image in the, in the dream, which of the course horn. is the unicorn. That's the key feature of a unicorn. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you would just have a white horse. <laughs> yes. Well, to me also, what's important is that she's excavating these bones and they don't necessarily have any life in them. They're artifacts of something yes. that was once alive. Ooh, good point. The unicorn is also an artifact of something that is now dead, that there is secret life in the horn, like a mm. rhizome or a mm. tuber or a root. Mm-hmm. That the thing that is um, looks dead, the life force has withdrawn itself into the horn. Again, lilac, like a lot of other. Uh, shrubs that are acclimated to very, very cold weather. All the life goes into the roots Mm. in order to survive the winter. Mm. And now it's time to excavate something that has been stored in the roots of things. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this dream is just such a perfect dream for what we were talking about today, because the 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 skull Mm. with its glowing horn is is kind of an image of this vital spark. Mm-hmm. And it literally was buried, and then it sounds like she did excavate it, and a few years later, uh, left her corporate job to become an artist. Mm-hmm. And and that is exactly, um, you know. In fact, I just want to I want to amplify the dream actually with um, just a little snippet from the book because it's just so kind of perfect. Um, Jung says. <clears throat> the social goal, this is Jung, the social goal is attained only at the cost of a diminution of personality. Many, far too many aspects of life which should have been experienced lie in the lumber room among dusty memories, but sometimes, too, they are glowing coals under gray ashes. Mm-hmm. Ah. And, yeah, isn't that a beautiful, such a beautiful quote? Perfect. But but this. here it is. The the unicorn skull has been like a banked coal in her life. And it, it may be that it's taking place in the front yard of her childhood home because uh it, you know, perhaps art was a love in childhood, just like we were talking about before for some of us, you know, like uh like Francis Gum and Judy Garland, we kind yeah. of knew. And now she's come back to it. What I'd like to expand upon is if the warthog's skulls are associated with the great mother, that the unicorn, which is often associated with the virginity, yes. that only the pure, the virgin, the uncorrupted consciousness can find the ethereal animal. Mm-hmm. So what we imagine is there, there was a unicorn, there was a virginal time in the life, Something occurs, and what the horn represents, which might be the artistic interests, passes out of consciousness, and it winds up getting buried. But what gets buried on top of it are more and more and more and more of the primal mother. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, Which may have been even appropriate at the time. I don't know if this person maybe had many years of being a mother. And so the artifacts of that build up on top of it. But if I can even just link it to my book, whether or not she's actually been a mother, the, the, the primal mother might be that kind of blind urge toward caregiving. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe you're, you're always the one who, uh, you know. You're the uh, work hog look, out there. Yeah, is looking out for coworkers or, or, you know, putting yourself out for friends or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's an interesting um, detail in the dream, Joseph. And I'm going to go back to my thought that it, a warthog can also be a great image of shadow. Mm. Warthog 
because they have these big horns. They're aggressive. Uh, you know, n- nobody feels all warm and fuzzy toward a warthog. And Speak yet, for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, I didn't. I didn't mean you, Joseph. I know. <laughs> you you, you offended warthog. warthogs and Tony Soprano oh. today, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good Lord. Where? What will happen next? But, but I, I do think there's a connection to shadow that we don't want to yeah. be. War, we don't want to be. A, I don't want to be a warthog. I would like to be a gazelle. <laughs> Maybe the warthog uh, could be the crone version of the pig in as much as it's kind of warty and yeah. fierce and <laughs> looks like something yes. the Baba Yaga might keep as a pet. Yeah. So I think all those things are are. Very good. They're not in opposition to each other. This is an additive process. It's mm-hmm. this and it's this. And it could be this and it could be this. And you, our dreamer, thank you very much. You know, see what resonates for you. What, like the unicorn horn, lights up in you <laughs> about, about, war, about warthog. And, you know, I'm also content to leave it to our dreamer and other people who are listening. What's a unicorn exactly? Mm-hmm. Well, I will oh, tell you that the, the internet my, will tell my you. symbol <laughs> dictionary has oh. multiple pages on unicorns. And Joseph yeah. already mm-hmm. alluded to the medieval legend mm-hmm. that uh, it would come and place its head docilely in the lap of a virgin. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's Christian symbolism that goes along with it, and on and on. There's a lot. So there would, yeah. that would be a, an interesting thing for the dreamer to do is look that up if she hasn't done that already. But thank yes. you. Thank you to everyone yeah. who submitted a dream. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to them all. Oh. If you want a, a better shot at getting your dream interpreted, remember, you can always become a patron. We do uh, patron uh, dreams from our Patreon uh, supporters. We do them, what, is it three times a month, Joseph, um, as extra dream episodes that people can give us questions or dreams Mm -hmm. we do one of those a month or we do all of them at the end of the month and we just put them all out quickly (laughs) but uh but generally speaking that we release individual dream interpretations submitted exclusively by our patrons Mm -hmm. so we hope you'll consider that and um of course we hope you'll also take a look at dream school uh which is our 12-month online program where you can learn how to interpret dreams, similarly to how we just worked with this one. Uh, Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, like us and subscribe to us and follow us on all the various platforms. We're on, we're Mm -hmm. on YouTube, we're on um, Apple Podcasts and everywhere else you get your podcasts. And of course, Buy the vital spark. Yes. <laughs> Get lit. Um, oh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and don't forget to write a review on Amazon and what Good else, reads. Lisa? Uh, Good, Good reads. reads and, yeah. and don't. Uh, yeah. Mostly, really I helpful. hope I hope you buy it and read it and enjoy it, and I I hope it resonates and speaks to you. And uh, yeah. But um, we do appreciate the support. So thank you all so much to everyone who joined us. And, and thanks again to everyone who, who uh, I, I th- that's just remarkable as how many people submitted dreams. Um, finally, mm. before we go in the last couple of minutes, um, links in the chat to uh, purchase the book and receive a meditation, a guided meditation, and also links where you can uh, purchase mm-hmm. the book and uh, anything else. I don't think so am i forgetting anything guys no just um stick with us yeah it was <laughs> it was great doing this maybe we should do this again sometime i'm aware there were there were oh. over 100 questions we didn't get to so maybe you know, maybe sometime we need to to do this more often so what i would be interested in that's uh an interesting uh idea going forward the jungian concept of telos of <laughs> Um, write to us. What would you like? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great idea. What would you like us to do? What would you like us to talk about it? How would you like us to talk about it? Um, webinars, just keep listening to the podcast, more Q and A, you tell us. 
And there's yeah. a link at the website where you can make recommendations. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to reach us. You can you oh, can right. absolutely Perfect. leave a recommendation for topics, and you can also email us if you if you have you know uh, comments on the format today. You can always yeah. email us at admin mm -hmm. at thisyoungianlife dot com. So yes, it was really fun being with you all, and uh, we will be back next week. Yes, we will. Yeah. Okay. It was great. And <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.